Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I know many of you are probably just finishing up your chores, sitting down. A lot of these games are reaching halftime, and you're uh, you're really excited for the first full Saturday of college football. I actually tried to do this video late Thursday night. Um, I ran into some technical difficulties, and you know, it YouTube just likes to be difficult. That's how they are. But uh, I did want to recap for you guys uh, the weekday action. And like I said, as you're settling in, you're starting to see these noon kickoff games reach halftime. Uh, for instance, I thought Western Michigan would put up a better fight. They seem to be uh, they seem to be getting roughed up a little bit there in the big house. But just to recap, some big stuff's already gone on earlier in this week. Um, obviously, Ohio State and Minnesota, that was a terrific game. However... In my opinion, one of the top five running backs in the nation, Mo Ibrahim, he left the game in a boot, right leg injury. We're unclear whether or not he'll be back at any point. I really, really, really hope he can come. If he has to miss a few games, that's that's okay. But I really hope Mo Ibrahim can come back and be a part of Minnesota's, you know, you know, Minnesota's charge through this Big Ten slate because in my opinion, he's he's a terrific back. And although Tanner Morgan's a good quarterback, you just you hate to see it. You know, even as an as an Ohio State fan, more or less. I mean, I just you know, I, I I'm impartial because I just I love good college football. I love college football. You know, this, this we're talking about a guy who could potentially be a college football legend. No matter what happens to him in the NFL, you know, he he has a chance to leave a mark, an indelible mark on the Minnesota football program and. 30 carries for 162 yards and two scores before going down in the third quarter. He was more than likely looking at a 200 yard game against Ohio State, which, you know, maybe there is an NFL future for him because Ohio State, as we all know, is an NFL factory. And if he was able to put up that sort of production against the Buckeyes, who only knows what he'll do against some of these other teams, let alone you know, in the Big Ten, let alone if he's is able to come back in the non conference slate still. Um, Boise State absolutely collapsed on Thursday night. They were up 21 points. It ties the largest comeback in UCF football history. Gus Malzahn, the biggest comeback victory for him in his career. And what a way to start out the Gus bus there in uh, Central Florida. That was, you know, and I worry Dylan Gabriel took a huge shot there late in the game. He lo He looks to be okay, but you just, I mean, again, like these guys, it, you want to avoid injuries, especially in week one. Um, Illinois linebacker uh, Calvin Hart, I believe it was his name. I was calling him Calvin Murphy, the NBA player earlier today, but Calvin Hart, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, Bednarik, uh, Defensive Player of the Week, Big Ten Defensive Player of the Week. He's already down for, out for the year. Uh, I think I believe it's knee surgery. Uh, Brett Bielema says it's not an ACL, but uh, yeah, that's. Do you just hate to see it? You've got some key guys that are already going down. Uh, Minis or excuse me, Wisconsin has a linebacker who's now set to miss not only this game against Penn State, but next week he has COVID, and you really hope Wisconsin can avoid another COVID outbreak. They were they were really affected by it last year. Some some FCS upsets already, people. UC Davis, who returned 21 starters. They actually have Dan Hawkins of Boise State fame and Colorado infamy. Uh, but Dan Hawkins led UC Davis. Actually, the Big Sky, both Big Sky pulls off two upsets against FBS opponents as Eastern Washington, who we all know that, you know, it's not just the, the blue turf there in Boise, but you also have the red turf in Eastern Washington. Uh, they, uh, they take, they take down UNLV in double overtime. And I, I, I think UNLV was like a one point favorite, but you come on, seriously, UNLV, I, I just, you know, I'm a running red. I'm, uh, in college football, you can actually kind of sprinkle in a little fandom here and there. And UNLV is definitely one of those programs I keep an eye on. I, I just, you know, I would love to see them. Do, and especially, they're playing in the Las Vegas Raiders brand new NFL stadium. And that's how you're going to christen it with a loss to an FCS team. I get Eastern Washington's an FCS power, but that's just, that's absolutely ridiculous. UC Davis stunned Tulsa 19-17 in regulation, but as we found out, Tulsa actually had a lot of suspension stemming from their post bowl game brawl against Mississippi State. Uh, obviously, um, Mississippi State 
they they didn't suspend anybody. You know, they don't care. Uh, boys being boys, whatever whatever crap they came up with, SEC, whatever. Um, but since Tulsa is like a legitimate, uh, respectful, uh, admirable program, actually ESPN named them the most stable program in America before losing, before come. Com- coming completely undone against UC Davis, but uh, Tulsa had a unspecified number of players that were actually suspended for the first half. They had one guy suspended for the whole game. So Tulsa was down some key pieces against UC Davis. I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure it's a legitimate excuse, but it is. It does offer some explanation as to why UC Davis uh, went ahead and pulled that upset. Also Dan Hawkins. I just did not realize he was still going. Um, App State, Appalachian State, um, they had that big loss to start last year against Marshall, which got Marshall rolling. Marshall won seven straight games to start the year. Marshall is up all the way to number 15 in the polls before uh, dropping their final three games, including their bowl game. But uh, App State looked mightily impressive against Eastern Carolina, who I think Eastern Carolina, they will be improved. Um, one of the best logos, I think, uh, between, between Tulane and ECU, you're looking at two of the best logos, two of the best uniforms, really, in all of college football. I do think ECU will be better, but App State, mightily impressive. Cameron Peoples, he's a just tremendous running back. Uh, he had over 100 yards. They actually had two running backs go over 100 yards in that game. Last night, uh, North Carolina, 10th in the country, they go down to Va Tech, enter the Sandman. I think, I think if people had a had a true vision of what that atmosphere is going to be like in Blacksburg last night, there might not have been as many people leaning with North Carolina because as soon as, as as soon as Virginia Tech ran out onto the field with that atmosphere, um, I w- I immediately thought UNC might be in trouble. Um, Charlotte actually stuns Duke uh, in a little in a little in-state rivalry brewing there. Charlotte's, I believe it's Charlotte's first ever FBS, or sorry, Charlotte's first ever Power Five win. Which it's really kind of funny to think that teams like UCF, Boise, who are playing for basically you know to wear the crown of the Group of Five teams, it's kind of hilarious to think that you know although that might be changing now with the Big Twelve expanding. Funny to think that their group of five teams that we consider Duke a power five team, Duke and Vanderbilt. I mean, you, you them wearing the power five label is just hilarious. But either way, uh, Duke scored on like a 50 plus yard touchdown run uh, with about a minute and a half left. Charlotte just drove right down the field and just put it to the Blue Devils. So Charlotte with a big upset win, their fans stormed the field. Um, speaking of storming the field, Kansas hangs on to beat South Dakota by three points. And yes, the fans, the fans, the Kansas fans storm the field after beating an FCS team. I don't think I've ever seen it. Uh, Leopold, the new coach for, for Kansas, he comes from Buffalo. When he saw the fans storming the field after hanging on to beat an FCS team in South Dakota, um, you could almost see it on his face. I, it w- I'm sure he was more than happy to get the win. You know, Kansas hadn't won a game and since t- 2019. I, they went winless last year. Um, you, you knew that he was obviously happy to get the win, but when he saw the student section celebrate like they had just won the national championship, um, you could see it on Leopold's face that he almost doesn't even realize. I don't think he realized what he had gotten himself into. Like like with so many coaches that try and go down there and fix Kansas, whether it was Les Miles, Turner Gill, you, you don't really realize how bad it is until you get there. And my, oh, my. They stormed the field after beating an FCS team by three points. Uh, something that re- I, more stunning than the Vot. I mean, yes, technically Votech gets a top 10 upset against UNC. But like I said, you know, Votech, they always have great defense. They, too, had great uniforms last night. Uh, but that atmosphere, it was just it was going to be incredibly tough for North Carolina. I also didn't realize that Sam Howell, quarterback for North Carolina, he's he was missing four of his top five targets from last year due to the NFL draft. I wonder how many of those guys actually got drafted or, or made the team. But uh, four out of his top five targets from last year left for the draft. And he, I mean, he was having a hard time. He, he's good at escaping the pocket, but it just seemed like he had a hard time staying and making his throws. Um yeah, I think though the biggest the biggest upset for me so far, if it's not been the FCS teams, if it hasn't been the top ten upset, 
MSU, Michigan State just ran right through Northwestern last night. Uh, first four touchdown performance on the ground for a running back for Michigan State in 10 years and over 200 yards rushing for the running back. His name escapes me. Um, he was a Wake Forest transfer, which actually you wouldn't think, but it makes you wonder now, Dave Clawson, why'd you let this guy go? He go he go, ships up to the Big Ten and he goes for 200 yards and four touchdowns on what should be a good Northwestern defense, although they, they did not tackle well last night whatsoever. They just did not tackle well at all. And now to our main event, Thursday night. Uh, if, for those of you that don't know, I am originally from Bowling Green, Ohio, born and raised. I am an alum of Bowling Green State University. Uh, I'm a Falcon for life. And um, my, my, oh, my, Tennessee, it, you know, I think Tennessee is going to be okay. I mean, they're not going to be good this year. They'll be they'll be good in about a year or two. They'll they'll maybe they will ascend to the top half of the SEC, the the Super Conference, the Southeastern Super Conference. They might just ascend to the top half of that. Um, but they fail to cover against Bowling Green. Many battles, in fact, you know, obviously Tennessee wins the war, but many battles. For instance, the turnover battle. Um, the quarterback battle. I mean, Matt McDonald, who famously struggled for a winless Bowling Green team last year, he he, in my opinion, he soundly outplayed Joe Milton. I understand that McDonald, you know, didn't throw a touchdown, but his QBR, I believe, was almost double, um, was almost double what Joe Milton's was. And Joe Milton more more incompletions than completions. And in fact, um, Tennessee was trying so hard to cover against lowly Bowling Green that with five minutes left in the game, now mind you, Matt McDonald, Bowling Green quarterback, already on the bench. Excuse me, already on the bench. Walk on LeBron's Davis. You heard it, LeBron's with a Z. Walk on quarterback LeBron's Davis had already been in the previous drive for Bowling Green, but that doesn't stop uh, Tennessee from bringing out their entire starting offense again with five minutes left. And on second down, I was wrong. I said it was first down. On second down after a two yard gain, they go deep, deep. I mean, they're throwing the ball deep up. At that point, I mean, it was four scores. They're up four scores with five minutes left in the game at home. And they, again, Bowling Green, arguably one of the worst teams, if not the worst team in college football. They were the only FBS team to be starting a freshman walk-on center. I mean, they barely can they can barely pace together an offensive line, for God's sakes. And yet even they had brought in a new quarterback, brought in a new running back. You know, I would say they'd brought in a new offensive line, but I don't think they have backups on their offensive line. But Tennessee comes out and just starts winging the ball down the field with five minutes left. It was the sorriest thing I've ever seen. And then finally, with two minutes left, after yet another drive where Bowling Green uh, remain, kept in its backups, um, finally, Tennessee brings in their backup quarterback, and they proceed to run no huddle, high tempo, and again, honestly, had they had just run the ball every play, I think the score would have been a you know it would have favored Tennessee a lot more. And by the way, they Tennessee mustered six yards in the second quarter. Tennessee was up fourteen to six at halftime. Fourteen to six. It was a one score game at halftime. Um, but yeah, Joe Milton was sacked multiple times, a sack fumble, and then. On the last drive, Tennessee probably would have punched it in. Um, they were clearly trying to. I mean, I, I, you know, talk about reps, talk about a new system all you want, but if that isn't the definition of running up the score, the other team had already brought on its backups, and Tennessee is winging the ball with its starting quarterback down the field. Just absolutely ridiculous with five minutes left. And then with two minutes left, they're high tempo, no huddle, running every play. Clearly, I mean, they weren't trying to chew up the clock. They were just simply running the ball because for them, that was the most productive way for them to get down the field and score. And they would have, if not a fumbled uh, read option. And yeah, so they, I don't know what exactly went on there, but. They fumble what looked like to be a read option. Bowling Green recovers. So Bowling Green forced, I was actually plus two in turnovers, had two fourth down stops, hit a 50-yard field goal. Their, uh, Nate Needham was two for two on field goals, including a, a career-long 50 yards. So while the final score was 38-6, to six, um, and, you know, 
to me, that was Bowling Green's best performance in years, absolute years. And I'm, I was ecstatic. I mean, I was on cloud nine after the second quarter. I thought it was COVID dreaming for crying out loud. I mean, 14 to six, Tennessee, six yards in the second quarter, Bowling Green, Bowling Green, Obviously, they couldn't run the ball because of this offensive line, but they were connecting on pass after pass. Matt McDonald looked, I mean, the mechanics are still a little shaky, but he was clearly had more zip on the ball. He clearly was more confident. This Austin Osborne, he's a he's a highly touted transfer from Washington. Uh, he's gonna him and Matt McDonald actually played in high school together. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. I mean, Moving forward, I think Matt McDonald has a real chance to put up some real numbers on some of these MAC teams. Now, maybe again, it's just Tennessee, and I need to temper my expectations. But no, I actually, for it being on the road in front of one hundred ten thousand people, you know, SEC Tennessee, I just think that with that, you know, here I was a week ago. I was worried Bowling Green's going to get scraped by Murray State. I no longer have that fear. Now they might not cover, or it might be a close game, and. You know, anything can happen. We've already seen these FCS upsets, but um, I'm not quite as concerned. Bowling Green was able to move the ball at times. It was able to really move the ball through the air on Tennessee. So, um, yeah, but I, I don't know who I was less impressed with, Joe Milton or Josh Heupel. Um, I've had some time to think, and maybe that's a good thing that we were able to come back today and redo this video because I was hot. I was hot at Josh Heupel. I just thought it was really low rent. Just wasn't really understanding what this guy was doing. Um, and again, I had I had a Tennessee fan explain to me that you know they need the reps. You know they need to get they need to get going with this offensive system. And but what what are you really gaining again by having your starters out with five minutes left against Bowling Green? Like what kind of reps are those even? I mean, my dad and I were talking about. The fact that Bowling Green's offense has to go against Bowling Green's defense in practice. And, and what does that get them? Let alone, what does it get Tennessee? So, no, I think I've worked myself back up into a shoe. And I really, I'm I'm almost disturbed by Josh Heupel, by Josh Heupel's actions there on Thursday night. It was just incredibly, I mean, I would venture to say it was embarrassing. So, um, yeah. I've gone way longer than I anticipated. I probably went 10 minutes longer than I ever thought I would, but I was, I'm very happy to have gotten um, us all caught up or have gotten you guys all caught up on the weekday action. Please enjoy the rest of your Saturday. You've got 10 plus 11. If you count the Hawaii game, if you're chasing Hawaii at midnight tonight, which literally kicks at midnight, it's not even on TV, um, you've got – You've got at least 12, 13 hours. But for the rest of us, we've got at least 10 plus hours left of college football action on the first full Saturday of college football. Um, this is my opening day, people. It's, you know, I, like, I, like I said on my channel before, I love baseball. Baseball opening day is truly an American holiday, but to me, it ranks second to the first full Saturday of college football. So you guys go ahead and enjoy. Uh, make sure to like, share, subscribe, comment. Uh, we'll work on this glare next time. I just, I rushed home from work. Just wanted to get this out there before the games today got too far along we'll work on this glare um i honestly suggest to like you know the video aspect of this i only do it this way because it's just the most convenient way i found out to found out, figured out to get content to you guys and so if i can ever find out a way more convenient way to go audio only on on a platform i, I will um but yeah the, the the video aspect of this it's literally just me talking into the screen so don't even just you know have your headphones in, you know, do whatever you want to do. It doesn't even matter to me. But, yeah, you guys, love you so much. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll catch you on the next one.